All right, yep, mic's on. Uh, good morning, my name is Kellis, pastor here at Berean Community Fellowship, but looking around, I think you guys know that. It's good to see you guys. Uh, we've got a few people who are out, either sick or traveling, um, without making people feel bad for not being here, just send them a message, say, hey, I miss you, I noticed you. Um, so one of the things I want to do now is just take a, a deep breath. We've had a crazy week. I don't know about you guys, but this has been a crazy week, battling sickness, going uh, to work, preparing for a new job, um, trying to take a next step in my leadership here uh, and, and, and branch into this, this unknown land of administration. Uh, <laughs> that is not my gift. Uh, but it's been a wild week. But we had uh, a party on Friday that I thought was super fun. All the cool kids were there. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, there was a lot of people um, doing other stuff too. But I think I, we had a blast. Um, and so I, I need to go over announcements. <sighs> Here we go. What do we have going on? No, no, don't tell me, don't tell me. Okay, Wednesday... All right, so our, the Berean life, we need to talk about this. Uh, this is something we've talked about for, for months, uh, maybe even a year. There's just the need for somewhat of a, uh, a transition into or uh, an orientation of what we're all about here at Berean. We try to talk about it, and if you come for any length of time, I think you'll pick up on a lot of these things. But just kind of a, let's just put it out there. These are our convictions this is our history. This is kind of where we've come from and, and where we are now. So we've broken that into a, a, a four-part series that goes over all sorts of stuff and hopefully has opportunity for us to, to ask questions and answer questions. Uh, and we were, had, had planned on doing that this month and doing it every Wednesday. Well, the first week, I think we didn't advertise it, didn't get the word out quite as, uh, as much as we needed. Um, so we didn't have it then. Uh, the second week, or this, this past week, I was sick. A lot of other people are sick. Uh, so we need to, we are going to continue with it this Wednesday. But instead of having it be the third part, we're just going to kind of play by ear and we'll see how much we can get to. Um, and so we are planning to have it this Wednesday. Again, this is called the Brian Life, L-I-F-E, where the, we kind of talk about the video, the video that we show every Sunday. Has anybody ever wondered, why does he always play that video? No? Oh, good, good. I don't want it to get old, but that, that, that video is really important to me. It, it's something that, that we like to share, and I hope you guys are watching it. You guys probably haven't memorized by now. Uh, but even the logo, what is the logo all about? There's actually a lot of thought into that logo. Anybody, real quick, pop quiz. We can do this because we're a small church. Does anybody know? No, never mind. That's spoiling. <laughs> you guys, all right, raise your hand. Do you know what the, the logo is and what it means? Anybody, uh, let's do it differently. Anybody not know? You're like, oh, it's just some cross. Oh, yeah, right on. Can't wait to share it with you um, on Wednesday if you're here. Uh, <laughs> so it just things into that. You know, well, why are we called Berean? What's her name? Why did you come to that? Uh, things like that. So it, it, we're going to get into what we believe, uh, some of our structure, some of our governance, um, just that. Who is the Berean? Um, who, are, who are those Bereans? So that's Wednesday. Uh, this Saturday is our, no, no, this Friday. We'll go Friday first. Um, this was not on the year look, uh, I guess, calendar that we put out there. It was kind of a spontaneous thing that we were asked to be a part of. Um, but the campus pastor, Ben Martin, asked us if we would uh, host and do like a, uh, a dessert outreach for the Lindsey Wilson football team. So uh, Keely, thank you, has stepped up. She's coordinating that. All of that uh, coordination of what we're going to be doing and what's needed is on our band app, but it's a cookie outreach and they've asked us to give a devotional. 160 Lindsey Wilson College students in the Hodge building, uh, the Center for Discipleship. Uh, it's right across from the cafeteria on campus. Uh, Friday night, 6.30 to 7.30. So what can you do if you want to be a part of it? Well, you can bake cookies. Again, you can coordinate that with, with Keely or on the band app. Um, but also you can come and mingle. Talk to these kids. Get to know them. And a lot of them are, are, are freshmen or they're not from here. Um, and if they're not international, they don't have host families. 
there's a good mix uh, and a good community in that in that sport on that team, but a lot of them could be looking, could be looking for a church, could be looking for a, a, a family in town, somewhere just so they can get off campus and get in someone's home. I really think if you guys come and you're outgoing and you're willing just to put yourself out there for, for Jesus, he's going to do something amazing. So uh, I, I'm planning on bringing a devotional, um, just about a 15-minute little message, gospel message. I'm excited for that. So that's this Friday, 6.30 to 7.30. Saturday, men, this is our men's breakfast, 8 a.m. This is our monthly thing. We'll have breakfast. This potluck, uh, I'm not providing it all or cooking it all. It's going to be a potluck. Uh, so bring a breakfast item, something to share. Uh, we need some like orange juice. I'll bring coffee, um, but some kind of whatever else. Bring that. Um, so that's Saturday, 8 o'clock. We usually go, it's about 10 o'clock. Uh, we're going to talk about Jesus and stuff. Um, so and then... Sunday, next Sunday is normal. I'm, do, I'm on a roll, guys. I'm on a roll. Right? And then the next Wednesday is going to be life uh, again. And then Saturday, next Saturday, the 27th is our church work day. Thank you, uh, Strands and Can Savages, for signing up already. Uh, a few other people have already kind of told me some things that you'd be willing to do. Uh, but there is a sign-up sheet over there. It's a brief list of some things that we'd like to accomplish. We do this about once a year. It's just being good stewards of, of, the, of the facility uh, and what the Lord has blessed us with. So there's going to be some painting. There's going to be some repair. Um, there's going to be a few things, maybe uh, uh, redoing the lights. Uh, I'm sorry, um, the blinds and putting up some lights outside for when um, the, the days start getting darker. Uh, and we and we have like night studies, so there's a little bit more light outside, a little for safety. Um, so just a few things, and you'll see the list. <sighs> Is there anything else? I think that's the month of August, guys. I'm I'm getting good at this. No, is there anything else? All right, so this is what I want to do. This is our time for announcements. Again, welcome. But is there anything going on in your life? Anything you guys want to share? Any updates? Anything you guys want to? Just praise the Lord about anything special. So is that a praise or a prayer request or both? You survived the first week right on. I know, it's that time. I'm really excited. We've got uh, a special guest here, Jared, back. He, uh, our college student, he's back a little early. Yeah, dude, you get clapped for, dude. How many churches are going to clap for? Yeah. No, uh, Jerry's a good, good friend. He's been coming here for years. He's a college student. Um, he went back home, served at camp for a little while, uh, but he's back because he runs the bookstore. Um, so he's back a little early. But I think the semester starts not this Monday, but next Monday. So I've already actually talked to a few other students that are coming back, and uh, they're pumped to be back with us. So not just, guys, I'm so proud of you guys, for real. These college students come in, and they feel loved on. They feel welcomed. I mean, that's just, you can't, you can't. I don't know. You can't. You, I, you can't fully describe how how meaningful that is and the impact it's going to have for years down the road, uh, during college years. Uh, that's a big deal. So you guys are awesome. Thank you. So so Jared, clap for us. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, any other notes? What else, guys? Say it again. Oh yeah, the twenty eighth. I didn't. I didn't get to that. So the twenty eighth. Yeah. Dang it. Well, so close. <laughs> so the 28th is our uh, grill out potluck. So this is a lot like a carne asada, but we're going to do hamburgers, hot dogs, stuff like that. Um, we, well, Callie actually this morning said that she would coordinate that. So you're going to just run all that pretty much on the band app. Um, and so we'll see what's needed. We've got some people, uh, praise God, donating a bunch of meat already. Thank you, the Myers. Um, but I think we still need more meat, but we'll need a bunch of stuff. This is going to be um, just like carne, uh, the carne asada time where we invite people to church, and then we're going to walk out uh, in a little early, and then we'll walk over to the park. We're going to do it at the park instead of here in the, in the parking lot. Um, so we'll be grilling out over there, and then the kids can play and, and be on the, on the uh, whatever. We'll just go play. So thank you. That's the 28th. All right, back to you guys. The ladies' brunch was sweet, yeah. Uh, Callie came home, just, just super blessed. I was really pleased to hear how, how she was ministered to. So, anything else, guys? 
I think I shared with you guys, right, that I got offered a new job, the one that we guys have been praying for for me for so long. I'm so thankful. Work from home, no more commuting. Uh, Lord willing, I think, I think starting August 28th, so I get to work from home. So awesome. Yeah. That's three, yeah, yeah, thank you, Lord. That's three hours of my day I get back. <laughs> it goes an hour and a half there, hour and a half back. Uh, and, of course, the wear and tear. I think I've been working there almost two years, and I've put 50,000 miles <laughs> on, my, on my van. <sighs> um, yeah, praise God. Um, all right, guys. Well, what you guys can expect this morning, we're going to continue through Acts. We're going to uh, probably finish 9 and get into chapter 10. Uh, but right now, we're going to sing some songs, musicians. Would you guys come on up? And I'd like to pray for us. Lord, we are drawing near to you, Jesus, and it's all about you. And I pray, Lord, that anything, if, if nothing else, Lord, we would just be in your presence. Lord, that we would hear from you, that we would sense, again, your, your kingship and your reality, Lord, that we would just be comforted and know that everything's going to be okay, that you know us, that you're with us. We're not alone. You've not left us as orphans, but you are here, present, loving on us and taking care of us. God, remind us of that this morning. We want, again, we want to draw near to you. We want to hear from you. And so we ask, God, that you would give us ears to hear and a heart to receive whatever it is you have to say. For those who need correction, I ask, God, that you would bring it. And the way you do, that brings us hope and encouragement, not shame and not guilt. I ask, Lord, that you would bring us uh, and lift us up, Lord, for your glory and our benefit, we pray. Amen. Is she not here? Where'd she go? Conveniently. <laughs> Who wants to take her place? Aslan does. Aslan, Aslan, Aslan does? does? <laughs> Done. Aslan it is. Please make welcome Aslan to center stage. <laughs> For I'm in the Lord's army. <laughs> and all three of the verses. I don't know, your Indian verse and stuff. Right? Isn't there an Indian verse and a chicken verse or something? Cowboy. Cowboy. I'm sorry. Everybody, please stand up for I'm in the Lord's army and follow Aslan. <laughs> uh, two, three, go. I may never march in the infantry. Different verse, different words. Oh, okay. So, do I do it quieter? I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never lie. Appreciate you. I've 
was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your side. So you made a way across the great divide left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside and there at the cross you paid the debt i owe broke my chains freed my soul and for the first time i had hope
Lord, I'm thankful for this morning, and I'm thankful for you already being here and preparing hearts ahead of time and what you're going to do. I ask that you would speak through Kellis, and that all of our hearts would be softened enough to hear what you have to say through him. In Jesus' name, amen. Buddy, I missed you. <laughs> yes. All right, guys. Thank you, musicians. Out. <laughs> you could have gone for another hour. <laughs> that was awesome. Can you guys believe we're in our fourth? If I counted right, fourteenth week of Acts. It took us two years to get the Romans. Uh, so we'll see. <laughs> yeah, Acts is longer. Uh, but I got a little bit of a, a pop quiz for you guys this morning. All right, you were, it's easy. Just one question. It's fill in the blank. Are you guys ready? So answer this in your mind. God is using me personally to help us dare to be the church by blank. I want you guys to think about it. How are you personally and specifically seeking to follow Jesus as he leads us, leads us all, in building and being the church in these days? I'll let you sit on that question. We're going to walk through our text. Again, this is a, a story, so keep in mind we're just trying to uh, paint the picture, kind of go through and walk through it and see it come to life, and then we'll maybe come back to this question at the end. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Acts. It's in the New Testament. <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. If you find yourself in Romans, you've gone too far. We're in chapter 9, and over the last 13 weeks, we've watched God. Again, this is a story, and it is amazing. It's so amazing just how we've seen God do the extraordinary. He has commissioned and launched, established and expanded the first century church through un unparalleled difficulty and new territory as they figure this out. He has just step by step lead them, led them, pardon me, to, um, to do the impossible. And last week we saw God do the impossible. In order to advance and accomplish his mission, God brought Saul to his knees as he was breathing out murderous threats just with the, the intent to ravage. And we talked about this. We're talking about like sadistic just torment of, of, of the church. That was, that was Saul. God brought him to his knees and even said to Ananias in verse 15 that Saul is his chosen instrument to bear his name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel. Just amazing. If God can do that, last week we talked about, if God could do that for Saul, nobody's off limits. Nobody stands a chance if God is after them and calls him. 
It's amazing to see just, I mean, and for you guys who are praying for people, and maybe you've been laboring for prayer, maybe for years, don't give up. There is hope. God is a master at just replacing hearts of stone with hearts of flesh. And this, this ought to give you hope. So this conversion of Saul is a significant moment in God's plan. And we're going to see in chapter 9 that Jesus, by His Spirit, is on the move once again. We're going to see just this extraordinary God that He is just progressively leading His church step by step, taking Him to really just unexpected boundaries and crossing them. So last week we ended in verse 31 of chapter 9. Saul, again, he is sent to Tarsus, and we read in verse 31, So the church throughout all of Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. And I love how uh, Aslan actually marked this. He actually said, he's absolutely right, I, I haven't mentioned it before, but the way Luke r- r- like write this... <laughs> The way he wrote this or writes this, there's like segments. It's like this cut, you know, this scene, and then we go to another scene. Uh, and, and so that's kind of like the, the, the wrap up of it. And then in verse 32, Luke shifts the scene away from Saul, and, and the camera, if you may, focuses on Peter. Why? I mean, we're going to see a lot done from Saul, Paul later. He's going to be doing a bunch, but it's actually Peter that God is going to use to really just prepare the way, get everything established and founded, uh, and then start really just smashing into an open territory where then Saul and others will pick it up and, and run from there. So verse 32, now as Peter was traveling through all those regions, how many of them? All of them. He came down also to the saints who lived in Lida or Lida. In the past, um, at least in the last part of chapter 9, there, there's going to be two miracles. We're about to see it. One in, in, in Lida, it's 22 miles north of Jerusalem. So, that, I mean, that's, that's a good hike, um, but it's still relatively in the commuting distance. But north of Jerusalem, and then, and then Joppa, if you go over to the west, about 10 miles or so, right onto the coast is where you get Joppa. And these towns are significant because we're going to see that God is taking, again, Peter progressively into places that are, let's say, less and less Jewish or more and more Gentile. We're going to see more characters and a new type of people being reached. We're going to get there, but literally first Peter has to actually get there. He's traveling. So verse 33, there he found a man named Aeneas who had been bedridden eight years, for he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. Kids, catch on to that last part. (laughs) It's in the Bible. <laughs> no, immediately he got up, and all who lived in Leda and, and, and Sharon, which is not a lady. This isn't you know Sharon. This is like like the county. It's like the Sharon region. It's like a, a, a plain. Uh, saw him, and they turned to the Lord. So Peter is visiting the saints, the community of believers there in, in, in Leda, and he encounters a man who's been paralyzed and bedridden for eight years. And then Peter, just being spirit-led, makes this declaration, get up, man. Like, in the name of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up, make your bed. And it's just crystal clear, and I, and I want to underline this. I want to highlight it. I want to bring it to your attention. Luke reminds us who the healer is. Everybody together, who's the healer? Oh, come on. Let's say it like we mean it. Jesus. Who's the man? It's all about Jesus. It's not Peter. Jesus Christ brought the healing. The only other detail that Luke gives in this situation, and it's important, but he points out in verse 35 that the people of of Leda and Sharon, all the surrounding area, that they turn to who? 
Christ because of what Jesus had done. And then Luke shifts the focus to Joppa. Verse 36. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek is called Dorcas. <laughs> this woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. Now, last week I mentioned the, the likelihood. I'm not saying that it was permanently. If you want to believe that, 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 that God changed Saul's name to Paul, that's fine. But really, it was more common that people would just have two names. They'd have their Hebrew name and their, and their Greek name. And they would go by both, depending on who they're with. So rather than the name uh, Saul, which is Hebrew, Paul was Greek. And so, anyways, I just bring that up because here, in verse 36, Luke begins this snapshot and he tells us both of this, this person's both of her names. He's got Tabitha, and then the, the Greek name, which is very unfortunate, is Dorcas. <laughs> Any of you guys you are expecting, this is on the list. Come on, put it, I dare you. All right, and the. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, just, I'm so mean. I'm a bully. Uh, uh, Lord, thank you for this person, and I would love her name. All right. And then the <laughs> Dorcas. I'm sorry. Oh, man. I never. I, this is, it's been a long time since I just can't stop laughing. <sighs> As the account unfolds. <laughs> Tabitha, Tabitha, uh, no, but he starts, he starts using this name over and over and over, and it's like, why, why, why use this name, Luke? I don't wonder if Luke's cracking up too, you know, <laughs> he's got like teardrops for the ink, just kind of, you know, what out from where he's laughing, anyways, thank you, Lord, um, okay. So in verse 36, describes this woman, no, and, and, all right, back to her character, he describes her and highlights her as a female disciple, which really is awesome. And that's, as I'm preparing this, is what I want to focus on. This is amazing. And one of our distinctives here that we've all come really to agree is that, uh, that, that, that what's it called? I'm actually, I'm totally blank on this. It's um, complementarianism, right? Is that, is that the doctrine where, where, where women... Uh, have so many roles, but there's one role that we believe that, that, that is not, that is reserved for a man, this position of elder, as pastor. And so often when we first taught through that, man, it caused some waves, and we had some people really get upset, and that's unfortunate because there's so many things that women must do and are called to do. The men, just to be honest, we're not equipped. We we're terrible at and so I love this. This is a female disciple, and she was active and important and valued and cherished in the church. She had a vital ministry, and we're going to see that. Verse 37, and it happened. At that time, she fell sick and died. And when they had washed her body, they laid it in the upper room, in an upper room. Since Lita was, was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men imploring him, do not delay in coming to us. So Peter arose and went with them. When he arrived, they brought him into the upper room, and all the windows stood, widows stood beside him, weeping and showing all the tunics and, and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. So clearly, Dorcas was, was deeply loved and valued by the church and Joppa. And so we read in verse 38, the men were sent, go get Peter, like go get him. And so they went, they, they traveled that again, 10 miles there, 10 miles back, and they were imploring Peter to come. Perhaps maybe the Lord would intervene. And so notice also in verse 39, and the widows were weeping at the loss of Dorcas. They were showing Peter what she had done for the church, all the clothes that she had made and, and shared. Just God had an extraordinary plan to advance his church here and really honor this woman. Again, this woman to be honored and, and, and just, just exalted in the church. Like she, I mean, not above Jesus, obviously, but you get it. I mean, like, like, like she shared in the work, in the ministry. So verse 40, but Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, 
arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And she gave her his hand, and he gave her his hand and raised her up. And calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. It became known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. This is amazing. But again, notice, what is Peter's posture in this? This incredible situation. He's not calling attention to himself. He's not Peter, the powerful celebrity healer, and starts, you know, getting admin and reservations and going around signing autographs. He's humble. He's completely dependent, a servant of Jesus Christ. He asks everyone to leave the room. And then so just in humility and quietness, this meekness and utter dependence, he takes to his knees and he just beseeches Jesus to do something. And, and some, some powerful thing, he just, Lord, do something for your glory. And he does. And the Spirit of God brings Tabitha back to life. And he gives her back to the church in Joppa where you know she's just going to pick up where she left off. Once again, guys, who is glorified? God is glorified. Jesus is made famous. And more people come to Christ. Not to, not to Peter. They come to Christ because of this. And I'm wondering, guys, does this sound familiar to you? Just even just the way this, this, this happens. Sending people out and praying. I love how, how Paul, or Peter is following Jesus' example. I mean, it was Jesus who said it in John 5, 19. Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of Himself and let it is something He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. And now you see Peter sending people out and praying for this person just like Jesus did. He's following Jesus' example. That's why I love even the, 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 the book of Acts and it'll say in your Bible, Acts of the Apostles. But it's not their Acts. It's the Acts of Jesus done by His Spirit through His Apostles. Jesus is alive and He's doing it again. And Peter is just following His example. He saw Jesus do it and so he did it as well. And so we end in chapter 9. We see this, this journey and another journey. And all just this, this enormous turning point in the story. Before we go on, and again, this is the turning point. This is, this is a pivot in the church. We just need to be reminded of what has not changed. We, got, we see the miracles happening. We see them in Lida, or Lida and, and Joppa. And two things come back, crystal clear focus. And this has to be something that we retain and, and, and really just highlight and make sure that we protect the focus is here, and the reality is Jesus is alive. He is still here. Peter said to Aeneas, Christ heals you. And then Peter hit his knees knowing that only Jesus Christ could raise up Tabitha. Peter, did, he did it just to like remember Jesus and remember his example, the sacrificial Savior. But no, he was proclaiming Jesus is alive, and Jesus is the one doing this. Big difference. And I think sometimes that subtly works into our life. We remember this Jesus. And we've talked about this, especially when we went through Revelation. Who is the Jesus that you prayed to? Is, this, is it this deceased carpenter wearing sandals? Or is this, this God who is alive with, with shining countenance and voice like many waters? Jesus is alive, and he's the one doing this. Jesus is still extraordinary. He's the living God who, through Peter, lifted Aeneas off his bed. He is the living God who, through Peter, lifted Tabitha from the, her bed of death. Guys, Jesus is alive, and he's here today. And whatever you got going on in your life, Whoever you're praying to, I want you to remember that he sees it. He sees it. Do you guys hear this? Jesus is alive. He sees you. He knows you. 
through and through. He's extraordinary even today. And he wants Peter to know it, and he wants us to know it. Let me ask you a question. Again, just think about this. Think about your reality, your experience, your Christian experience. Is Christ alive to you? Honestly, do you honor a moral teacher? And that's good. I'm thankful for that. You know, do you seek, though, to emulate some spiritual leader that you can read about in, in this document called the Bible? Or do you actually walk in living relationship with a man that is eternal and present? I mean, how often throughout the day do you seek to cultivate consciously communion, fellowship with Jesus as a living being, alive and present in your experience? Some of you guys aren't even asked. You're not even, you're not even thinking about this question right now. You're not even thinking. I don't, I, I, I don't know what you need. You're not even listening. Is Jesus alive in your presence? Is he alive in your life? Do you have conversation with him? It's not about, did have you raised your hand, walked down, become a church member, got some kind of baptism certificate, all that stuff's going to burn. Do you have a relationship where you speak to him and you listen to him and you desire him and you seek him day in, day out? That's what I'm talking about. I'm not trying to beat you up. I just want you to hear that none of that other stuff matters. It doesn't matter that you're part of Berean Church. Kids, you're not saved because you come to this church. You're not saved because your parents are saved. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? He's alive, and He desires that from you and for you. So, we just need to remember these things and realize that Jesus with Peter is leading him and doing these things in the church. Before we turn the page, Jesus takes Peter and Luke takes us one step further down the road. And so we see verse 33. And Peter stayed many days in Joppa with a tanner named Simon. So this, this is important. Nothing in Scripture is just a read over. Everything is valuable. There's a point here. Why did he tell us about this step? Why did he tell us about this, this seemingly inconsequential step? We'll get back to that. So one verse, just a detail in the story, but it's another example of how Jesus is leading Peter and us to get where he wants us to go. I called it a journey. Step by step. Again, again, I'm not going to go in detail now, but I just I wanted to at least say that. So we move into chapter 10. Remember, this is a tanner, uh, even a, a Jewish tanner like Simon. Um, he was considered unclean. Why? Why would he spend his days handling animals that were unclean? Why would Peter then be with him if he was unclean? Why would he hang out with him? Well, we're about to find that out. So in verse 10, I'm sorry, chapter 10, verse 1. Now there was a man, again, new scene. You know, we're, we're, this is still happening, but we're going to like cut over here and go over there. Now there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius. That's a cool name. A centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. A devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. So Caesarea, I think I forgot when we talked about this. I forgot what study. But we, we, we've talked about that city. It was built by Herod the Great. It was named for Caesar Augustus. It was the seat of Roman administration in Palestine. So a majority of the population there were Gentiles. It even had a temple dedicated to, to Caesar. So this was really the heart of the Gentile penetration into this area. So not a place, I mean, there was Jews there, but not a place where they really liked. I mean, they were, they were outnumbered. It was just it was like maybe the, the capital, the, the Gentile uh, invasion. 
Um, but it was a heart uh, 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 of, of, of the Roman subjugation there, um, again, hated by the Jews. And so, so Cornelius lives there. He's a centurion, a leader of about 100 men of the Roman army. And, and how does Luke describe him? Again, I didn't even, I'm, thanks, man. I, when people laugh, I wasn't even telling a joke. When people laugh, I just, I'm so endeared to them. Thank you for laughing. So, anyways, how does he describe him? He says, as a devout and God fearing, caring for the Jewish people, committed to prayer, not to the gods of Rome, but to the one true God of Israel. So, in the heart of this Roman influence in all of Palestine, lives a man who was a, a proselyte. He, he, he had converted to Judaism. Or, or it was a Gentile who was seeking after God. Really? <laughs> All right, sorry. I love kids, and I love when they run around. I love when they giggle. I get so distracted by it. I love you guys. All right, but bring this back. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who was speaking to him had left, he summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier of those who were his personal attendants. And after he had explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So here we have a Gentile, again, not an Israelite, but a God-fearing, God-seeking Gentile. And he's praying during probably one of the usual Jewish times of prayer in the afternoon. And the angel appears to him, says that your prayers and your alms have been heard. They're, they're a memorial. God, God delights in them. And this, all this is really, really similar to the language of the sacrifices of, in the temple. An angel tells Cornelius, Cornelius to send for Peter. So this is, this is remarkable, very extraordinary. Again, a, a Gentile in a city built by a Gentile uh, uh, ruler in honor or to, to, to really worship you know, a pagan god, a Roman empire, uh, emperor, he's visited by an angel from heaven. And he gets this, this, this vision and this message to go out and do this. And so um, this, is, this is really cool. So the, again, at this point of, of the story, you have to remember that this is just kind of a, a sect. You know, this is just like a, a, a movement that started. There wasn't a Christian church. I mean, really, Cornelius maybe has heard about this sect, but this wasn't an established thing. I mean, the, even like the term Christian hadn't been used yet. That, that comes later. So maybe he's heard about it. <coughs> <Excuse me. coughs> maybe he's heard about it. Maybe not, but he's told to go and he does. So on the next day, this is a long passage. <clears throat> As they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. But he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance and he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground, and there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. A voice came to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy or unclean. Again, a voice came to him a second time, what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. This happened three times. And immediately the object was taken up into the sky. So as Cornelius' men from Caesarea approach Joppa, Peter goes up to the rooftop. He's praying. He's probably in the habit of doing that. It's not a very unusual time. He's, he's there. He's awaiting lunch. And the Lord just, just, just gives him a vision. 
<clears throat> and he sees this sheet, all these animals, and a voice comes from heaven and tells him to kill and eat. Now, this is, this is strange. I've heard a lot of crazy interpretations of this. I'm not going to go too deep into this, but just think about it in our culture, in our time of history. We don't really understand what's happening here. You have to have a little bit of a, a background of, of, of their culture. And the, the key, though, verse 12, is that the sheet contained all kinds of anim animals, crawling creatures and birds. And these would have been off limits to the Jews. They weren't allowed to eat a lot, a lot of stuff. They weren't allowed to eat pork. They weren't, I mean, or have bacon, which is pork, but uh, it's his own thing, and we all love it. Um, it's just things that, that would have been considered unclean, that he wasn't allowed to eat. And so any devout Jew in that, in that era, just they would not have come. They wouldn't have had that. I mean, again, think of camel or rabbit or pork, things that we eat all the time. Um, <laughs> so the voice from heaven tells Peter to kill and eat these things. And Peter's like, no, Lord. Which is weird. I mean, God's telling you to do it, you know, like do it. But he's like, no, Lord, I wouldn't do that. And, 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 and just, I don't know. You're, you're, we're going to see this tension. And, and, and it, it, it remains with Peter for a long time. This, this tension of this is what he's been raised, this is what he's been taught. And so I'm really thankful that, that, that this voice came from heaven, they said, look, I, I'm doing something here. And what if, if I have clean, cleansed this, if I'm telling you it's fine, don't say it's not fine. I hope Peter remembers this. And maybe maybe when, when, when he gets into this argument later with Paul that, that he, he's reminded of this. And, um, but just, you know, it's to reinforce the lesson. Be sure that Peter can't chalk it up to some hungry hallucination at the end of that scene it happens twice more god is going to just drive this home i'm doing things i'm changing things i'm cleansing things don't say it's not clean or unholy if i've cleansed it and made it holy so what's the point why why do i hesitate on this why do i just re remain here why does it matter guys since the fall of man it was always God's intent to bring salvation to all the peoples of the earth. Through his incarnation, through his death, through his burial and resurrection. But before Jesus came, God chose a people. Descendants of, of a man named Israel through whom he could reveal his nature and his character and to show why sinful people cannot dwell in the presence of a holy God. And so all these shadows and pre-shadows and foreshadowing, all these things, God created laws to set up Israel apart from the pagan nations. And all these things that he gave them in the, were, were included were like food regulations and the ways that to set up the temple, beautiful stuff, and we've studied many of them. So in Acts 10, though, God now is just trying to help Peter and the early church show that Jesus has fulfilled the law. All these laws that they were required to keep that were ingrained in Peter from early age, God is trying to just tell them it's fulfilled. It's accomplished. And so Christ has fulfilled the law and we're able to approach God through a new avenue, a, a, a new means, through, through the risen Jesus that we can come boldly to the throne room, according to a new covenant established again through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so the opportunity for relationship with God is now available to everyone. That is a very, very quick kind of overview of, of the Old Testament and how it leads into the New Testament. Christ fulfilled the law, and now we have access to through a new means, not through the keeping of laws and regulations and sacrifices and offerings, but through the accomplished work and the righteousness of Jesus. So how do you get a group of Jews who are steeped, like Peter, steeped in Judaism, 
to move away from that, from just being a sect of, 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 of Jewish Jesus followers, to actually being a new and living temple, a, a new church with a living God that is composed of all sorts of people and available now to every tribe and every tongue. You have to go step by step. And he's gradually leading, leading them to see this. And again, you see the struggle with Peter. No, I'm not doing it. Slowly but surely. So that's happening in our text. Acts 10 and the beginning of 11 represent a, a critical pivot in the book away from just being a sect of Judaism to actually a new church a new doctrine, a new covenant that is going to be available to every tribe, every tongue, every nation. Yes, feel that? All right. Verse 17. Now while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked direction for Simon's house, appeared at the gate. And calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. But get up, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for which you have come? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. So, so he invited them and gave them lodging. And on the next day he got up and went away with them and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. So in God's perfect timing, he just demonstrated, again, this is the sovereignty. God is working things. He is orchestrating things. He's pulling the scenes and making this happen. Immediately after this vision, the men show up, precisely at the moment that God has brought Peter to just this, this moment of, or point of readiness. So step by step, God took the apostles and the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea, and then to half-Jewish people of Samaria, and progressively now into Gentile-inhabited areas of Lida, or Lida and Joppa, and now on the way to uh, Caesarea. And so this is, this is amazing. God can do wonderful things. But before we close today, and we are, we, we, we're about to wrap up, just, just recognize again the sovereignty and the goodness of God. Sometimes when we say God, we, well, maybe it's to say it like this. We say it too much. And we, and we lose the, the, the awe-ness that comes from this title. That's not his name. That's his title. He's God. He's omnipotent. He's om omniscient. He's om omnipresent. And he's on the move. <laughs> and he's doing things. Jesus, by his spirit, takes Peter from place to place to place. And he's showing Peter, I'm still alive. I'm working things. You thought I was just bringing you this vision, but at the same time, I'm giving Cornelius a vision. And I'm working things. Do we believe that these things are still true? Do you guys believe that Jesus is still working things in and around you? Not just in your experience, and I pray it is increasingly in your experience. But I want you to believe that he's working in other people's life. I want you to believe and be excited for what he's doing in other churches and other nations and other groups. He's at, he's at work. And he's building his church. And he's taking it to all the nations. Guys, do we believe these things are true? Do we live daily believing that just as it was here in the first century, it is today. God is still equipping and building and sending his church. Guys, do you believe that he's extraordinary? And do you see it? 
we, we, we live in this pluralistic world, and, and, and this is increasingly, again, we've talked about this, and we'll continue to talk about how really upsetting it is to people to say that Jesus is for them. You know, they want their own thing, and everybody has to, to each his own. But we believe differently. We believe Jesus is the answer. We believe he is for everybody, and everybody needs him. Jesus is right here. He's extraordinary. He's for everybody, this amazing Savior, this living Lord who offers us love and and hope and life and purpose and forgiveness. And as he offers that to us, he, he says, now go offer it to other people. Go out and spread it. To get to every tongue, every tribe, every nation. And that brings us back to the question that we asked at the beginning. How are we personally and specifically daring to be this church? This church that hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll say and you'll confess is the same church with the same risen Christ pulling the shots as he was then, he is now, how are you personally and specifically endeavoring to be a part of his church, a part of his mission? Guys, Peter's example in our text shows us if we're going to be the church, and guys, this is not the place for you to not be the church. <laughs> if you don't want to be the church, you want to sit, you want to watch, you're going to be uncomfortable here. There's times and seasons I get it to rest but it's rest for the purpose of getting back in and being used and being on mission and purposeful. We're going we're gonna to see some wonderful stuff. We're going to see it in the coming weeks. But just remember this, guys. If we're going to be a part of the church, it's going to require us to be willing to get our hands dirty, to get involved, to be used, to be available. Getting our hands dirty so that hearts might become clean. Cannot sit on the sidelines, simply hoping from the distance that people will come to know this amazing Jesus. You can't just sit and hope that maybe because you got a bumper sticker. I'm sorry, I'm I'm really pulling punches. And bumper stickers are great, but that's not enough. I'm sorry, it's not enough. We have to be willing to cross uncomfortable barriers, to die to ourselves, to give up our time, to rearrange our life, to be a part of something that lasts forever, to be a part of the church. It's for the good of others. And it's going to look different for each of us. It is. You have to ask yourself, what are the passions and callings that God has given you? What are your gifts? What are your experiences that you can use to comfort others? Each of you guys uniquely fashioned and equipped and called for the same purpose, but in different ways, in different avenues. Guys, great advances of the church come from small steps of obedience. As as God's people, followers of Christ, just think about Peter. He didn't go from cowering in the upper room straight to Caesarea. He didn't just he didn't, he didn't just go there. It was step, unusual steps, but acts of obedience, taking him from where he were, where he was, to where we see him now, to this pivot point in the church. He takes each of us step by step, and I'm just asking you to just think about this. What is God calling me to do? What's that first step? What do I need to do? What is God calling you to do? And be obedient to that. Because when we choose to follow Jesus step by step, before you know it, this this extraordinary God is going to bring you somewhere incredible. Just like Peter. This God now is leading him into Caesarea, and then the the gospel is just going to explode and go all into the world, into the known world, how about you? How are you taking spirit-led steps to be and build 
the church? Are you getting your hands dirty in some kind of ministry? Now, we're a small church, and there's a lot of ministry opportunity here. Not that we have that ministry already and you can just plug right in, but it might be something that God is calling you to start. I want to come alongside you. I want to equip you. I want to, I want to enable you. I want to encourage you. That's my calling as pastor. But maybe there's another ministry that's even out in the area. This is not just Berean. This is global church. What are you a part of? What are you involved in? How can I equip you and encourage you, enable you in that as well? What are you doing? What are you involved in? I love seeing you guys here this morning. I really do. And I said that and I meant it. That's not enough. I'm sorry. I'm not that... I'm, not, I'm just demanding more and more and more and more of, of you. I'm just trying to be real with you guys. What are you involved in? Who are you ministering to? Where is God leading you? How are you being obedient? Are you taking spirit-led steps? If not, guys, I implore you, like the men from Joppa implored Peter to come to Tabitha. I implore you guys, don't waste your life. Think about all the stuff, man, guys, that I've been through. Stupidity. <laughs> I've wasted too much of my life. I don't want to waste anymore. I don't want to waste anymore. I was just mowing the lawn yesterday, and I just, just had to pull over and just start praying. Because this is my life's work. You guys in the church, I want to be known for this. I want to I want to I want to be a part of this. Whether I see it come to fruition or not, I want to I want to know and be a part of a work that brings the gospel to people who've never heard it. Or maybe the people who love the darkness and then God by his sovereign work and something that I maybe I had a part of it. God rescues those people and brings them into this marvelous light that we just sung about. I want to be a part of that. I don't want you to be a part of it. I don't want you wasting your life to working for the weekend in a Volvo. That stuff matters not. I implore you like this. Take a step. Get your hands dirty in some sort of ministry. Seek Jesus. Let Him lead you. Let Him tell you what it's supposed to be. Be obedient to Him. Cross some uncomfortable boundary. Guys, and that's the only way you and I will ever actually get to be a part of of this church. And guys, I, I dare you. A triple dog, double stamp dare you <laughs> to be a part of the church. I dare you. Let's pray. God, I, I just ask that you would just strike from our memory, strike from our thought anything that I said of my own. And I'm sorry, Lord, for for my disobedience day in, week out. Lord, but I pray for all of us, myself included, that we would return to you and cling to you and beg, Lord, that you would use us, that you would send us, that you would replace our own selfish endeavors with your purposes. Lord, let that be our heart's mission to be your church, to be used by you, to bring your good news to people who are dying and are desperate for you. Lord, thank you for saving us, Lord, but you use us to save others. Lord, we want to be your church. Show us how, Lord. Thank you for building it, Lord. I trust you to do your work. I trust you to build this church. I trust you to encourage us and to correct us, to speak to us. Lord, I trust you. This is your church and you are our head. Speak to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Because I'm praying for you and I hope that you can continue just drawing near. There's, there's a word in here. There's something that was said this morning that God has for you. I don't know what it is. But I'm praying that, like we said this morning, that you would have ears to hear and a heart to receive. 
I pray you don't just have a hard heart. I pray you're not distracted. I pray you're not just going to in one ear and out the other and just be gone back to your mundane, pointless life. (laughs) I'm sorry. I don't want to, I just, I'm I'm just being real with you guys. I I don't want to do that. I don't want to live for a, a perfectly manicured lawn. That stuff burns up. What are we investing in? Let's, let's encourage each other right now and ask people, how's the life in you? What's God saying to you? Just pray for somebody. Encourage you guys. Let's be the church. Let's minister to one another in these next few minutes as we have together. All right, guys. And everybody joining, we love you guys. We're praying for you guys. Uh, sir, if you're still watching, I am praying for you. I'm praying for your church. I pray this in Jesus' name. See you guys.